I think Megamind put it best when he said what separates villains from supervillains is presentation. In storytelling, I think this is what separates a great villain from a not so great one. Some of the greatest villains in cinematic history have memorable and creative introductions. I recently watched the third installment in the Kingsman series, and how the movie handled the antagonist genuinely frustrated me. I honestly don't intend on this becoming a critical video essay channel, and I'm not going to criticise this film in general. So instead, I'll try to explain what I think was so wrong about this introduction, and compare it to some of the greatest villain introductions of all time, to hopefully come to an understanding of the do's and don'ts of writing a powerful villain. The bad guy in The King's Man has very few scenes throughout the movie. The first glimpse we get of him has him staring into a fireplace in the shadows, while the slightly less bad guys wait for him to turn around. I honestly don't have a problem with this because, even though we can't see his face, the rest of the room are in the same position. My problem begins when he turns around. The camera slowly moves towards him. Finally, we're going to see who he is. The movie can finally get going. He's turning around and the camera moves behind him. We feel betrayed because now that the room can see him, we are alone in not seeing his face. The rest of the scene follows this pattern. Most shots are positioned behind him, and the ones that aren't have him in the dark. So my problem isn't necessarily the choice to hide his identity. I understand that this creates suspense. It's just the cheesy way they have chosen to achieve it. There are a few more scenes like this before the climax of the movie, which reveals his identity. All these scenes use camera placement as tricks to hide who he is. And that's what they are. Tricks. It's not clever or even necessarily well motivated. On June 23rd, 2003, WWE wrestler Kane was unmasked for the first time. Tension builds as he hesitates, but eventually Kane turns away from the camera, takes off his mask and turns around, revealing his face. Gasps are heard from the audience and commentators, and it's honestly an extremely exciting moment. From his debut in 97, until this, Kane's face was concealed by his mask. Now, imagine if, instead of a mask, every time Kane was about to turn around, there was a cut to a different camera which he wasn't facing. Imagine how frustrating that would be. We as the viewer at home would feel cheated, because everyone else in the arena would know what he looked like. Well, that's essentially what happens in The King's Man. There is a scene where the oh-so-mysterious villain is fencing with somebody. He's got his fencing helmet on, which is fair enough. Quite a creative way to conceal somebody's face. But then he takes it off and it cuts to a shot from behind him again. As I've said before on this channel, we, the audience, are the camera. So, the choice to constantly move us so we can't see someone's face feels unmotivated, involuntary, and forced. Camera movement and placement can be used effectively and, most importantly, creatively. I've mentioned how it's our alignment with the characters that makes us feel connected to what we are watching. Look at this scene from the opening of Avengers Infinity War. Ironically, in a video essay about villains, this example is not about Thanos. It's about what happens in the moments before his reveal. The movie begins with a wide shot of the Asgardian ship. The first shot we get from inside the ship is from ground level. The Asgardians are injured and defeated as they lie on the floor. Because of the camera placement, our perspective is the same as those who have been defeated. Infinity War is a movie about our heroes losing, and about evil prevailing over good. The audience is on the side of good, so therefore we share the defeat. So, the camera placement can play a part in the introduction of a villain. It just needs to align with the theme of the movie. Quick word about Thanos. To have your villain kill a previous villain without breaking a sweat is an excellent way of emphasising how serious a threat he is to the Avengers. Sometimes cinematography can be used to conceal someone's identity. In The Departed, we are introduced to Frank Costello through various scenes which include him as a shadowed figure. There's something so much more credible about using lighting to create a silhouette of a mysterious figure than quite literally moving the camera so we can't see who the person is. You may say that The King's Man does use lighting to conceal the villain's identity. So what's the difference? 
What interests me is the motivation behind choosing to do it. One of the main themes of The Departed is betrayal. Pretty much every character experiences betrayal at some point. The audience and every character in this movie are vulnerable to this betrayal. So therefore, when a betrayal happens, it fits in with the theme of the movie. I genuinely can't see any other motivation for the King's Man to commit this betrayal other than shock factor. Of course, we very quickly see what Frank Costello looks like, but that sense of mystery has been established effectively. Betrayals of the audience can work in the opposite way. They can work to fool us into thinking somebody is evil. For example, in Harry Potter, the first shot we get of Snape antagonizes him immediately. Harry glances over to Snape and they lock eyes. The camera draws in closer to Snape and ominous music builds. We cut back to Harry who gets a pain from his scar. This is misleading because obviously in the Deathly Hallows we discover who Snape truly is. He is not the awful man that he was antagonized to be his whole life. A bit of a weirdo, yeah, but not evil. So if this was misleading, why is it okay? Why is the story allowed to trick us like this? I think it's because our protagonist, Harry, is misled too. In fact, only Dumbledore truly knows that Snape is trustworthy. If this scene played out with a cut to Snape, with the same camera movement and music, and Harry wasn't even looking in his direction, then yes, we would have a right to feel cheated. We would be alone in thinking Snape was evil, and it would feel cheap. But it's our alignment with Harry as the protagonist that makes this acceptable. It's also worth mentioning that the reason Harry gets a pain in his scar is that he's quite literally facing Voldemort. As I said earlier, the slightly less bad guys in these Kingsman scenes know exactly what the villain looks like. It's like the opposite of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when the audience knows more than the people they are watching. For example, we know that Heisenberg is Walter in Breaking Bad, as we watch Hank destroy himself to try find him. This is fun. It makes us feel special. A huge part of the fun of Spider-Man is us knowing that it's Peter Parker. It forms a connection between us and those in the know. The same goes for Bruce Wayne and Batman. The reason I bring up dramatic irony is that it simply must never happen the other way around. We must never be the only ones in the dark about who they are. So what about when we are in the dark? How BBC's Sherlock handled Moriarty in season 1 is a decent example of how to build a villain's presence before they ever appear on screen. Sherlock fights the baddies in the first two episodes and just about comes out on top, but they are all revealed to be under the thumb of one person. Moriarty. They fear this person more than anyone else. So when Sherlock and Moriarty finally clash heads, we get the sense that they have both truly met their match. The same could be said for the Joker in The Dark Knight. After watching The Batman a couple weeks ago, I thought I'd go back and watch the Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. The introduction of the Joker and The Dark Knight in general has been covered to death by the video essay community. So I want to use just one word to explain why villains like these have such great introductions. And that word is anticipation. To have your audience anticipate your villain's presence is such a powerful tool in storytelling. Not only does it make the eventual reveal more impactful, but it also has an effect on the entire film. If your audience anticipates the presence of a villain, then that presence will be felt in every other scene that they are not in. The Joker represents chaos, and that chaos can be felt until the moment the credits roll. The King's Man attempts to build this anticipation, but to be honest, my anticipation never grew further than a slight feeling of curiosity. So by the time we had the eventual reveal, it felt flat. Spoiler alert, but it turns out the bad guy was this guy, who was in a bunch of scenes throughout the movie. This is now even more comparable to Moriarty's reveal. Moriarty also appeared while hiding in plain sight. I think what worked about this twist was that his initial scene was far more memorable than those in The King's Man. When he reveals himself, the reaction is something like, oh, that guy. Whereas in The King's Man, it's more like, who? To be honest, by this point, I just didn't care enough. I felt so betrayed as an audience member that when the moment finally came, my only emotion was relief. There was no Kaiser Soze moment. It was more of a, oh, okay. I think this is perhaps partially down to the fact that this movie is so incredibly self-indulgent. 
it thinks it's part of some epic franchise. The truth is, is that it's just not. Movies like Infinity War, The Dark Knight, and even wrestling have the benefit of years and years of build-up that the anticipation kind of looks after itself. If you've seen The King's Man, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Maybe even tell me why I'm wrong. I'd love to be convinced. And lastly, I would love to give a quick shout out to my brand new Patreon page. I currently struggle to find the time to fully devote myself to making these essays, but one day this channel might become financially viable enough for me to do it full time. So any support would be massively, massively appreciated.